computer. Here we go. Okay. Share. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. There you go. Once again, good afternoon, and thank you for joining me. Um, on a topic, great art teachers, and I hope you are great art teachers, or any other teacher, educator, homeschooling parent, but a parent that's really serious about preschool development and its role in preparing children for writing and reading in 2022 or later, if they're not in grade one this year. So if they're grade one teachers or grade two teachers, um, obviously any teacher, anybody is welcome, but I am going to pitch this afternoon specifically to preschool and people involved with preschool. Tomorrow afternoon, we talk about the older child. And if we talk about um, emerging writing and reading, and you'll hear I always say writing before reading, and I'll explain it a little bit later. But when we talk, we, we think about creativity, it's typically associated with the right brain. And that's what neuroscience has taught us, yes. It is about the right brain because the right side of the brain or the colorful part of the brain is incredibly important, in, especially in terms of the 21st century skills. And a lot has been said about it, but let's just simplify it. In terms of preschool children, what is very important about the 21st century skills is children's ability to read people and the environment. So that's impressions. Okay, that is reading body language, that is reading pictures, that is reading road signs, you know, the ones like a stop and a traffic light, I mean, things that they eat, which is always a very easy thing for them to learn to read those, it's incidental reading, but it's observing and reading the environment. So that's very, very important, because with that comes nonverbal um, intelligence. Remember when we do a, in those days when we st still did IQ test, there's a verbal and a non-verbal IQ. Okay. Nowadays it's unpopular. We don't do that because unfortunately children are very often labeled and um, there was a ceiling to their potential based on a, on a test. So the approach is different now, but the, the, the reality is still that there's something called non-verbal intelligence and there's verbal intelligence. So preschool and research is backing up and it's constantly showing us that the right brain develops before the left brain. The right brain is full of color and shape and non-verbals of communication, the tone of voice, the volume, the, the direction from which it comes, there's so many things, and on a visual level as well. So we need to develop the right brain to be able to transition to the left brain. And for that reason, it's incredibly important that we spend enough time, especially preschool, in developing the left and the right brain. But, but right brain first, that's what I want to focus on. You see, th that, that the future is about the ability to, for, for children to be able, and for us, to be able to read the environment and read people in the environment because that enables one to adapt. And can we for this afternoon say, learning is the ability to adapt. But before you're able to adapt, you first need to be able to observe. And observe is not just visual, it's using all of your senses. Also, the tactile sense of touch. Is, it, is this hot? Is it cold? Is it rough? Is it smooth? Well, it's not true that the right side of the brain develops way ahead of the left brain. It is a simultaneous process. But the right brain, the nonverbals, are slightly ahead. And that's why children start speaking way later than they start walking or interact with the environment. It takes them more or less 12 months before they get to walking and talking. And that talking is very basic, fundamental talking. So it's a simultaneous process. And so what is the left brain, which in this image is a little bit gray and not so 
So exciting is the right side of the brain, but it's incredibly important because the left side is the, of the brain, whether you're a child, whether you're a, a, a teenager, whether you're a student or an adult, assessment is always geared towards the left side of the brain. So obviously it's incredibly important, especially in an academic environment that we de develop that left side of the brain that's full, full of rules, there's a right way of doing things. It's very funny. There's a right way of doing things in the left brain. And there's a freedom, there's freedom of expression in the right side of the brain. So to develop, now we're going to talk about the development of the right brain preschool. And then we're going to see, okay, so what, what does all of this have to do with writing and reading? So you cannot develop the right brain without learning to listen. Yes, to language, of course, but it's also to close the eyes and listen to a story because it develops imagination. It's also to close the eyes and, and listen to, where, what can I hear in my in direct environment? Is there a dog barking? Is there a car? Are there more than one car? Can I hear more than one car simultaneously? If teacher walks around and everybody's eyes are closed and they tap somebody on the shoulder and that person says, hello, can I identify that person's voice? Who is that? Can I name them? And I, can I point in their direction? So listening is a way of stimulating creativity because as you listen, it's food for the creative side of the brain. But so is seeing sense. Auditory development, always talk about auditory before we talk about visual development at the Mangmus Institute, because our work is based on biomimicry. Biomimicry means you turn to nature. We learn from nature to solve problems that we are experiencing in terms of learning. And it's very simple. If you think of a baby in utero, they hear, and they hear remarkably well and a lot in utero. It's not 100% clear, but there's enormous auditory stimulation in, in utero. And it's only when a baby is born that they really start to develop their vision and their sight. Why well, it's pitch dark inside. They are aware of contrast, light, and when you move into sunlight or into shade, um, a baby in utero is aware of that. But can you hear that, the, that a child's auditory development has quite a few months head start on their visual development? And it's important. It's very, very important when we get to writing and reading to realize the importance of listening. And I think anybody would agree one of the biggest challenges at the moment is for children and parents to listen the first time. So how else can we develop creativity? Through fantasy play preschool. Yeah, it's imagination. Because in the imagination, you don't always have to know the vocab. But in your mind, in a child's mind, they can come up with all kinds of ideas and just act on their ideas and obviously, it's simultaneously stimulating language development and specifically in terms of, of vocabulary. Music and drama, come on. How can you move? How can you sing? How can you do any of that without stimuli stimulating the right side of the brain? Every time a child moves, their left arm, their left ear, if they can move it independently from head movement, but their left arm or their left leg left side of the body, you're automatically stimulating the creative side on the, on the right. And then when you move your right arm and leg, what are you doing? Simultaneously stimulating the left side of the brain. So, so movement, and that's why gross motor movement is so incredibly important preschool, because it's stimulating the whole brain and specifically the creative part of the brain. So we can, we can embark on a, a, a deep discussion this afternoon on creative activities in preparation, never forget, it's in preparation for writing and reading later. How on earth do you stimulate creative activities and the creative part of the brain without rhymes and stories? Because you know, if you show them a picture, that's marvelous. But most stories have a few pictures and for the rest, 
They have to imagine. They have to imagine what it looks like when the cow jumps over the moon. You, it's, look at those emotions. You see, the moment the child is, is participating, is learning to develop their listening skills, their visual skills, they're busy with fantasy play, movement, dance, and song, and they're listening to stories. They're developing the imagination and the creativity. And while they do that, they simultaneously, where there's language involved, and specifically language of teaching and learning in the classroom, or language of learning and teaching in the classroom, if there is language involved as well, because how do you interact without language? You're simultaneously developing the, the left side of the brain, which is associated with language and logic. Can you see same activities, hugely influential in terms of whole brain development in preparation for writing and reading. Obviously, music, percussion, mm. and it doesn't have to be fancy stuff. Just watch using th um, these children using things from home or just bottles with different levels of water because it creates different sounds. Using different wooden spoons and a, a metal whisk to play on pots creates difference in sounds that develops those ears because we need developed ears for language. We need developed eyes for language. Music is fantastic because it enables a child's receptive language, listening, and the expressive language, which is speaking. It enables them to develop both. So does sand play. Through those stitches, how does a child play in the sand without interacting with the environment? And as they interact, they think. We think children don't think, they think. And as they engage with water play, what do they do? They engage. And the moment they're engaging, they're observing, they're wondering, they're questioning, they're curious. It develops the imagination, but it simultaneously develops language. And so does any form of gross motor development. We can speak about gross motor development or any of these topics, music, sound play, water play, gross motor development, fantasy play, and in all of the other slides and topics that we've, that we've briefly touched on, we can speak a whole afternoon on each of those topics. But we want to, we want to focus on creativity in the preschool class specifically. Just wanna go back to the 21st century skills. And we said it's, the right brain develops before the left brain, which immediately tells us if a child missed out on creative development, it would hamper the transition to the symbols of language, which includes numbers and the letters of the alphabet, plus punctuation marks and things like that. So language is actually at the heart of creative activities. Oral language in terms of listening and speaking, but also written language in terms of visual perception, what you see and what you create. So it's observing, so passive observation, and then creating with the hands. And in creating with the hands, you see what you've created, which is building a bridge towards writing and reading. So oral language obviously develops way before written language. There's a, there's a roundabout, and if we can believe the optometrist and the researcher, the neuroscientist and their research about the development of the eye, there's more or less seven, a seven year head start in terms of oral language. So written language, oral language, needs to develop for seven odd years before a child's really neurophysiologically ready to embark on the written language or the written code of a language. Isn't that phenomenal? We, we transition to written, written language way too early. And one of the things, and it's, if, we, if we consider the British system, which to a large extent we're following, who have been following in South Africa, if that system of teaching children younger and younger to start writing and reading, the British system encourages reading from the age of four, 
So if that was the most appropriate um, strategy, we must look at the world rankings in terms of literacy and see where, where the British system actually ranks. And it's not very high. The Russians, the people from Singapore and a couple of other countries way outperformed that system. And they both have a very, very strong oral tradition first, establishing this cause, this, this um, um, encouraging speech and language, uh, arguments, debate, curiosity, but all expressed in language. And, and with that, very strong creative um, development because creativity and creative arts, movement, drama, but the creative, art, um, creative activities as we do in a preschool uh, is absolutely linked. The research at the Mindfulness Institute and the Neurological Institute in Russia has found without a shadow of a doubt that when a child is drawing, when a child is cutting, making any form of a picture, they are transferring what they've observed in the environment, what they feel like on the inside, what they've processed in their minds when they draw a picture, when they paint a picture, when they do a collage or do a box construction or any of the other art um, ways of um, embarking on creative activities, they are actually writing in picture form. Creative activities equals the ability to write, but in picture form, age appropriate writing for a child in grade R and younger. If you can just for a moment, open both your hands in front of you. And you, we obviously read from left to right. So your hand on the left hand side, those five fingers represent the first five years of a child's life. And your other hand, your right hand represents a child's transition from preschool to primary school. And that's what makes grade R such an incredibly important year because it forms the bridge between your, your multi-sensory playful preschool years up until the age of five and a bit going on to six. So grade R must still be, be playful. Grade R must still be utilizing the child's whole body if the child will be able to transition successfully from preschool to primary school in the year that they turn seven. And you see the year that they turn seven is, is way associated with the right hand. Grade R is, a, is the completion of our preschool years. And it enables us to transition to the world of, and, and the child obviously as well, to transition to the world of symbols of a language. But the preschool years, the focus is on picture symbols because every picture that a child creates, whether they draw it, whether they paint it, whatever art form they use, they are writing a story. They are creating something in a written form. It's not through the alphabet, but it's in a visual symbolic form. It's not a real house. It's their picture of. It's not a real pe person. It's the symbol of a real person. So preschool children make marks on paper. They are writing. They are putting their thoughts down on paper. And then they're going to read it back to you. So preschool creative activities is preparation for writing and reading but it can't be measured. Put away those rulers and the pencils, the HB pencils. No, it's the preschool years. Those are still the years of color and fun because this is what a preschool child looks like when they engage in creative activities. Obviously their hands are just a bit more dirty. That is not a preschool child at work. This 
is a preschool child at work. Because the creative activities preschool, if it's, if it's presented the way that is in line with the way a preschool child learns, it gives them opportunities for self-expression. And self-expression means no two pictures look alike. Because the moment all our pictures look alike, who are we expressing? It can't be me because they all look the same. And none of us ever represent anything in exactly the same way. The moment a child is given a blank page, and obviously the bigger the page, the greater, because the bigger the page, the greater the opportunity to really express themselves the way they want to. So you must remember, preschool children often lack their fundamental gross motor skills that enable them to develop their fine motor skills and contain their work to an A4 piece of paper. That's why we always start, even in grade R, if a child has not had the opportunity to express experiment with, with creative art through a paint, crayon, cutting, gluing, collage, all of those mediums. If they haven't done that pre-grade R, that's where we have to start, start in grade R to enable that child to transition from multi-sensory experiences to creating thoughts on paper, to symbolize their experiences on paper, it's a very difficult skill that takes more or less three years to develop. And that's what makes children who come straight from a, from a wonderful free preschool experience where they've never, never drawn in any way, even with sticks in sand, is also creative art. We need to enable those children to transition to make their own marks on paper, to understand that when I draw a funny looking, it's a mermaid, when she has drawn this mermaid, she's put it down on paper. Can she read that? Can she tell you she's dr drawn a mermaid? Of course she can, because it's her marks. But she first needed to learn that my thoughts can be presented through pictures long for three years. She had to practice that skill. It's a cognitive skill. Yes, it's a fine motor skill too, but it's predominantly a cognitive skill that will enable her to come to you, bring that picture and say, look, I've drawn a whole group of mermaids. And when she said, look, I have drawn, what is she doing? She's reading her picture. So children need experience to draw, right? and then read their pictures to be able to understand that the, you can create symbols on paper or on screen, and that can be read back, isn't it? That's why at the Mind News Institute, we are adamant that writing should precede reading, but a little bit more about that later. So the moment we give a child um, a photocopied duck, for instance, Beautiful duck, beautiful border. It was added on later, no child cuts that border. Because if the child could cut that border, well, definitely these pre-cut um, orangey, yellowy pieces of paper would have not landed up all over the show. This is not, this is not creative preschool, appropriate preschool creative activities. Yes, I do know that it looks better than at the child's scribble and the child's version of a duck. But the question is, who did the thinking? The child didn't have to think much. The child simply had to take those squares, work with glue, which is a complicated skill, and, and paste it or glue it within the, the lines. So the parent may think, oh, this is a beautiful picture. See how hard my children is working. No, the teacher is working very hard before the lesson, she's doing most of the thinking. You see, and that's why in preschool, part of creative activities is Play-Doh play. Playing with Play-Doh, it's a form of creative activities. Yes, they can use shapes to, to, um, for, for cutouts, but the most important thing about Play-Doh is developing the muscles within the hands 
I don't know if you know, but there are no muscles in the fingers. There are only tendons in the fingers. The, the muscles of the hand is in the palm of the hand. And that's why children need to play with Play-Doh play a lot. Because as they play with Play-Doh, they open and they close their hands. And with that, developing their hands, the muscles, and the tendon. So in time, their clay work or their Play-Doh work can transition into more delicate work, like the picture bottom right. Can you see? That's not a three-year-old a photo of a, of a three-year-old playing with Play-Doh. It's an older child. It's not just for three-year-olds. Can you see the concentration? Can you see the eye-hand coordination? Can you see how that child has a story in mind and it's creating through Play-Doh, different colored Play-Doh. She's, she's creating a symbol. In this instance, three-dimensional, but it's still a symbol, it's not a real thing. You see, when we think of creative activities preschool, it's always actually more often than not about paper. And paper is important, the size of the paper I spoke about already. But, but why must it always be a rectangle? Why can't it be a triangle? Why can't we do, do pictures on a, on a circle or a massive rectangle or half a circle? Why does it always have to be paper? Why can't we change the textures? Paint egg, egg containers. It's a completely different experience. An old cake tin. And, and work with, with um, the inside of toilet rolls or paper towels. And bubble plastic texture creates challenge. So when there's enough challenge and variety, Children never stop creating because there's always another aha. And every aha experience that a child has is a boost to the self-esteem and the development of the emotional part of the brain. And the emotional part of the brain is the part of the brain that determines attention and focus. Yes, there is a cognitive component to attention and focus but it originates in the emotional part of the brain. And if the emotional part of the brain is developed and a child often experiences, aha, aha, because I have just discovered a new way of painting or a new, at a new level, it doesn't always have to be down on a desk. It can be angled on an easel. It can be against the window. So it's vertical, completely vertical. It doesn't always have to be with a thick paintbrush. It can be a, a flat paintbrush. It can be for the boys, oh, the boys and the girls. But driving with a car through a paint, especially once I've covered that entire sheet of paper using my hands, I've covered that entire page with paint, I had to cross the midline. And it would be very difficult to only use my one hand. So it's bilateral integration, crossing the midline, and then they create a marvelous texture while the car is driving over the, the picture. Yes, you can do it when the child is three years old. You can do it when they're six years old again. But then later on, maybe they can use that texture as a background. For, for a picture that they're going to create with crayons or with a different kind of paint. Or maybe they're going to cut some shapes and place it on there. Or maybe you, they are going to draw some shapes on those pictures and cut them out and create a completely new picture. The challenge, if we are prepared to enable and allow children to experiment during creative activities and not be so incredibly prescriptive. If we enable them to draw with chalk on the floor, sometimes on the wall, you can wash it off. They can wash it off using two water pistols in their hands, which is wonderful for laterality because they become aware of both their hands simultaneously. And then they use the water to clean the surfaces that they just used to draw on with chalk, using mud and finger or paintbrush, obviously, 
Crayons are marvelous, and there's a variety of crayons. Drawing in sand, painting, painting with, with, um, with cotton wool, or with fingers, or with paintbrushes, or on the hands, or between the fingers, and using different kinds of paint. It's marvelous, because every experience, preschool, should always be associated with a theme, because otherwise it's just a lot of loose activities. You must remember, or you don't have to remember, you can just listen in a class. Are children quiet while they're doing creative activities? Absolutely not, because they're interacting, they're discussing, they may be talking about something else completely, or they may be talking about what they are creating, but it's all about language developing. The importance of tearing before cutting cannot be overemphasized because children need to learn to use their thumb and index finger together to tear, to tear towards or to tear away from, and increasingly smaller pieces of paper that they then later glue into and use in some kind of a picture of their choice. Maybe if it's green, it may become grass. If it's long, thin pieces, or maybe if it is um, more in the shape of a, a leaf, it can become a tree. Or maybe if it's green and you do it as an oval, it oh, circles, it become eyes in a picture. We need to use different techniques Enable children to use different techniques, not a complete picture per day. That's such a limited way of, of using the creative arts time in the CAPS document. Because if you build up a picture during the course of the week, and every time there's another layer and there's more of a discussion, marvelous for oral language development while we are working towards written language development in picture form. So tearing before cutting. And I know the, the quality of this photo is not excellent, but I had to enlarge it. So you can really just look at this little three-year-old, watch that mouth, watch that hand. How must I cut this thing, teacher, mon? I'm actually still at the age where I should tear a lot. But maybe if my teacher just turned my hand and held my hand and helped me and show me how to cut a picture, I can create a fringe around. So it's just little snippets that enable that thumb and the index finger to move apart in preparation for written language later. You see, in the brain, is that the Mindhouse Institute? We work from a neuroscience perspective. And neuroscience is showing very, very clearly when the hands are not developed sufficiently yet, we use the mouth to support the hands. And that's why we often see during creative activities that children would use their tongue or move the jaw or use their lips because the mouth is one hand, mouth, two hands. The mouth, that's why there's oral um, language development before written language development, because there's one hand, uh, one mouth and two hands. So when the hands are battling, the one hand to hold the paper, the other one to draw, cut, or whatever they're doing, they recruit muscles from the mouth to support the hands. Watch this little girl, she's a little bit older, developmentally ahead of the previous one, but it's clear to, to see that she's slightly older. But see, that mouth is slow supporting. You see, the thing with cutting is very, very controversial. And there are as many opinions as there are kinds of scissors. But I want us to just briefly stop here because ladies and gentlemen, what is fascinating about the brain is the moment that the thumb moves in opposition to the, the rest of the fingers. In other words, the thumb moves away from the fingers. It coincides with language development, verbal language development. If you think of a baby when they crawl, 
when they position their hands down on the floor, they spread their fingers and the thumb moves in an opposite direction to the rest of the fingers in readiness for crawling. And there's an, a tsunami of research that indicates the importance of crawling in a baby as prepar a preparation for literacy and numeracy later on. There's an enormous body of research that shows us that when the thumb moves away from the other four fingers, it coincides with the onset of language development. But now how do we really cut? Well, neuroscience teaches us that the fingers that move together wire together. And if you think that when we hold a pencil, we hold it through the, with the thumb and the index finger, Cutting is preparation for pencil grip. And if you look at the, the picture top left, you'll see the thumb is in the, one, um, in the one part of the scissors. And because it's a young child, there's an oval and that oval enables two fingers. That kind of scissor is wonderful, especially if a child is new to cutting, irrespective of the age. If they're new to cutting, irrespective of age, that is the most um, appropriate kind of, of scissors to use. The moment you are introducing to the scissors where the, 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 those parts are identical, it's not an oval, they're both sort of circles. This is the kind of scissor that a teacher uses to guide the child's hand from behind. So obviously the child will put their thumb and the index finger through the first holes over here and the teacher would guide the hand, similar to what this teacher is doing, but putting her thumb and index finger over the child's hand to teach them how to open and close scissors. So here's a very interesting thing. Many, many teachers and many occupational therapists encourage children to, to cut like this. Thumb in the one um, circle, the middle finger in the other one, and the index finger at the bottom of the blade to guide the blade. And it makes a lot of sense to do it. But on a neurophysiological level, this is not the most appropriate way to cut because it will impact on a child's pencil grip later because the thumb and the middle finger is firing together. So they'll be wiring together, which may have an influence on the way a child holds a pencil later on. Mind Moves Institute, we encourage teachers and therapists to use a thumb index finger combination because then the thumb and the index finger Move, to, um, move together and then they wire together in preparation for um, the, the ideal pencil grip. Where does this come from? Neuroscience teaches us. The thumb and the index finger are our two skilled fingers, while the other three are our supporting fingers. They stabilize the hand, but our intelligence in terms of the use of our hands lie over there. These are the fingers that babies use when they um, start eating finger foods. These are the fingers that you generally use to fasten buttons or zip up or zip down your, your um, jacket. Or, so these are our supporting fingers. And that's why when we do creative art preschool, irrespective of age, we need to remember that the focus is on developing the thumb and the index finger for fine motor control, because when we teach the child to write, because the moment you have written a symbol, if you've drawn a picture, it's easy to read the symbols of your picture because it's your marks. But when we in grade one, towards the end of grade R and grade one, start moving, recognizing or introducing some of the letters of the alphabet on an auditory level, with a picture, but the focus is on an auditory level. It's very important that the hands have already developed all the muscles and all the stroke lines, 
vertical, horizontal, round, diagonal, all those muscle movements must be in place before the child will be able to write well. And when they're writing the letters of the alphabet, it becomes so much easier to recognize the letters of the alphabet later. So cutting round um, shapes that they've drawn themselves are a very advanced way of cutting. So you see many, many people and many great triple naught and younger and double naught teachers allow children to draw like this. My question is why on earth would you allow that? Yes, I do know that there are many articles that say this is a natural step towards um, a pencil grip. I fully disagree. If this child has climbed on the jungle gym enough, caught balls, um, pushed on their hands, crawling under a table, over a chair, through a tunnel, through a long tunnel with different textures. The hand would separate spontaneously and the fingers, the muscle tone in the hands would automatically develop sufficiently. And if we see that that hand is not developing um, sufficiently in great triple knot, we introduce clothes space to develop this muscle strength and the brain's awareness of thumb and index finger, because if they've developed this grip for a couple of months or even years, and then the child is in grade R and the child is battling with pencil grip, that child needs to unlearn. They need to undo a wide pathway in the brain before they can acquire or develop the ideal pencil grip that will enable them to write and read with ease. This is not what we encourage in any grade. If you see that, it simply means the child needs to be aware that they don't, those four fingers on the paddle, it's not a unit. They need to separate. And for that, a hand massage. If you want to look on the Mind News website or you just want to look on YouTube and you YouTube Mind Moves hand massage, it's a wonderful massage that you can share with the, the children's parents, that they can massage their children's hands at home. You don't have time to massage each child's hand in classroom. So it's the parents' um, privilege to do that, especially while they're telling or reading a story to their children every night. Mm. Again, just to remind, remember, the thumb and the index fingers are the skilled fingers, and the other three are there for support. And for that reason, children need to do a lot of creative activities and other activities that in the popping bubble plastic, you know, that, that kind of working with pigs, hanging pictures on string using pegs and all kinds of activities like that for three years for the index finger and thumb to become so skillful that it can write the letters of the alphabet. And as the children grow and develop, the creative activities also um, um, indicate the advanced skills. Threading is another way of getting that thumb and that index finger to work together. You see, when you look at this creative art, whether that's a box construction, do you see this town? Whether that's something like this, where there's other form of box construction, they're creating roads, they're putting people in the car, it doesn't matter. It looks actually looks like a, a police car with a blue light so these must be prisoners at the back that looks like their family. Or maybe this family is prisoners. I don't know. But whatever the story, we need a child to read this story. So that's why we can't read this story because we don't know their symbols. Are you with me? So over here, cutting out, or first painting, creating texture, and then cutting out that snake who was thinking all the time? 
No, 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 I need to go. <laughs> Melody, um, can we ask Naima to switch off her microphone? Naima, can you please switch off your microphone? Thank you. Not yet. Are you done? Naima. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, so, Melody. So if you look at this picture, it started off, this is obviously a very skillful hand that drew the, the images, but this picture started off as a blank page with dots. And then the, the child had to think of ways to use that dot to create a cherry, a sun, a funny looking man, the front part of a violin, a face. You see this, this is who was thinking? Well, only the person who prepared and got the blank pages ready and got maybe they were dots that were just stuck on a page randomly, but who did the thinking? And you see the, the bit of a key over here? It is marvelous because creative activities are actually opportunities to develop a child's thinking. So when we present them with a worksheet, who did most of this thinking? Yes, when a child needs to complete and for instance, circle or do a cross over every um, picture where there's a circle, the child is going to think, but this is not that. And it is definitely needed at some stage in a limited way in grade R, because increasingly in grade R, children, our children need to learn to get used to other people's symbols. Because when they create art, can you see the variety of art? Can you see combination of reality and written? This is her art. And that is what is enabling her to be a wonderful reader later on. Because creative art in a preschool is not a waste of time. It should never, ever be diminished. So we've got more time to spend on workbooks, worksheets, and writing and reading in grade R. If you like what you heard and you want to maybe learn a little bit more, you can con connect with Chantal who manages our preschool program or you can look at our Facebook, join our Facebook. And on the School Readiness Facebook, we'll put a link so you can get um, or access this recording afterwards. So I'm going to stop sharing. And if there's any questions um, or comments, I think we've still got a couple of minutes. I will gladly answer if there are any questions. Uh, Melody, there is a question. Uh, Emma, you are welcome to ask your question. Hi, how are you? Very well in yourself. I'm well, thank you. I just want to find out the name of the YouTube video for the hand massage. Can I have it please? Because there are a few kids here that still have that grip. Okay, it is just, just um, Google YouTube and then search mind moves hand massage and you'll find it. Okay, oh, thank you so much, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Anybody Thank else, you. anything else? Benny, can you please just unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Benny. Hi, um, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm a great art teacher, um, been teaching for a very long time, um, but you're never too old to learn and there's always, you think you know everything, but sometimes it's nice just to have you know, to be confirmed that what you are doing, what you aren't doing isn't the correct thing. Um, no. I, I think in the COVID times, um, it's very difficult because we are using more worksheets and paper-based um, learning. Um, but this has just given me the inspiration to go back to 
to to the draw to the normal you know um so thank you so much you're welcome Betty. the thing is the virus sits on worksheets too yes so yes. i absolutely cannot see why we can't do creative activities yeah. I, i've just found over the last two years the, the kids are seated we don't have this mat time so they're seated at the table um, I know, right. I find it fascinating because viruses don't, aren't airborne. So luckily no. when we sit at tables, um, the virus doesn't spread. But strangely enough, I'm being sarcastic, obviously, <laughs> but when they sit on the carpet, it seems that even if there's social distance, it's discouraged. We need to start thinking. Because yeah. We're yeah, no, I'm definitely yeah, very inspired to get back to doing more creative work and not focusing so much on the formation of alphabet and the, and, and the paper based. So that's, thank that's, you. Thank you, Penny. Emma. Okay. Is it Emma? Uh, is it Anna Lee? Okay, Anna Lee. Hello. Yes, that is me. Um, afternoon, Melody. Hi. Um, I have done. I have done this pre-school uh, and, and reading readiness program. I just want to tell everybody that it is the most wonderful course I have ever done throughout my whole teaching career, even with my training. Uh, the material that, was, that I have received was excellent of excellent quality. And wow. I'm just keeping on reading, reading this program, the videos and everything that went with it. It is absolutely it empowers you so much that you just renew your passion for, for preschool and things that I've never, ever learned, never even knew um, that came out in that. And I just want to say to everybody, please, um, you know, join Melody's program because it is worthwhile and you can do it in your time. No one is rushing you. Um, you can do it whenever you have the time and you can please invest in that. That is such a well worth investment. Thank you. Sure. And Lee, nobody will believe I didn't pay you for this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Much appreciated. Marini said there was somebody else, a last hand. No, there's just uh, one or two lovely comments in the chat box. There's a Pam Clark who says she has attended a few of your workshops and your knowledge and insight never ceases to amaze her. She thank loves you. your workshop. So thank you, Pam, for that lovely uh, response. There's a hand from Linda. You want to unmute, Linda? Yes. Um, good afternoon. Um, no, thank no. you very much for the workshop. I really enjoyed the detail that you gave. Um, I'm a grade one teacher, but we find a lot of children still cannot, they can't even cut with the scissor. Mm -hmm. So what you mentioned about the brain development and language development, it really fascinates me. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. If I can, can just I, ask. I really want yes, to I'm encourage listening. you, Linda. I really want to mm -hmm. encourage you because obviously you're a dedicated, passionate teacher really yes. full relationships with the grade R mm -hmm. teachers or the schools, if there's yes. not grade R at your school, and foster a relationship where they understand the importance of doing grade R work and not a mini grade one, because they're not doing anybody a service, because if they're not doing their job, yes. you need to do grade R and mm -hmm. grade one in grade one, and that's not serving our learners. Yes, yes, yes. It's very true. No, thank you so much for that. And can I just ask you, is there a register? I'm sorry. Is there? And um, the participant list serves as a register. Oh, sorry. lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And then, Melody, another nice comment right. from Anandi. This is the dirty of the kids. <laughs> I believe the better they learn. And um, I think she's uh, teaching in a special needs school. Absolutely. That's an interesting comment from her. Thank you very much. Marion, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate Naptosis and the work that you specifically have done and are doing at Naptosa to, to just enable teachers to, to, to think and learn from each other. 
And thank you for, for the opportunity for me to share the little bit that we've learned. And um, we're fortunate, I don't teach. So I get to do a lot of research. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share that with others. Much appreciated. Millie, did you want to tell people where they can access the recording you've made? Um, on the Facebook, um, Marion, what I'll quickly do is I'll write in the chat group. I'll quickly write the, um, no, I'll go back to the slide. It's going to be a, the easier version. Let me just go back to that slide. And if people then just want to, just look at the school readiness at Mind Moves and look for us on Facebook. We'll, we'll place it on Facebook tomorrow. Obviously, they can sh um, um, write down that number as well and send a, a WhatsApp message. Oh, cool. But um, we, it will be pl um, placed on Facebook tomorrow, on that specific Facebook. Super. Thanks, Melody. Thank Last you very chance, much. if you want to ask a question, Penny and Linda, I presume those are old hands. You haven't got another question? No, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, right. Uh, last you, chance. Mark. Right, it looks as if everybody seems satisfied. So just a very big thank you to you, Melody, for your wonderful understanding and insight to that preschool child and how they learn. Thank you very uh, much. Mary. Wishing everybody a lovely evening and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Go well, stay well. Bye everyone. Melissa says she loves attending your workshops. Do you have a reading? Do you have readiness assessments, Melody? That's what Melissa wants to know. I'll respond to it. Um, did she ask for a reading readiness assessment? No. I'll read what she wrote. She said, always love attending your workshops. I would just like to find out, do you also have readiness assessments for grade one or is it only for grade R? No, we do focus on grade R and this afternoon was specifically focused on grade R, but we've got a program called Neurodynamics that I'll speak about a little bit tomorrow towards the end of the presentation, because the presentation tomorrow is similar vein to this afternoon, but aimed at um, foundation phase, grade one, two, three. And then I'll Thank talk you. a little bit more about the assessment. Great. Thank you. I think, yeah, no, that's it.